Welcome to Deep Tech 315. That's Doug. I am Gene. Our three topics this week. Our first, Apple's Vision Pro hits the shelves. Second is hearing a little bit about an AI bubble coming powered by TSMC. And last, we're going to talk about Apple trying to dodge some of the impact related to steering. So we'll take it to a top, Doug. It's uh, rare that we get Apple announcing a whole new product category. Today is the day. Uh, Vision Pro went on sale this morning. I went on. I uh, was right there when the uh, orders began and got through the process in about 10 minutes. And after I had this like sinking feeling in my stomach, I just spent $3,800 on a device that's going to have pretty limited utility over what I think is the foreseeable future, the next one to three years. And as I think about uh, when developers are going to get behind this, it's probably going to take that much time. And this is really going to be about developers and early tech enthusiasts, probably over the foreseeable future. I agree with that. And I think just like we saw with the iPhone, in some cases, when you put that and open it up in the hands of uh, sort of the infinite creativity that you get from the developer community, some magical things can happen. Uh, my objection with the Vision Pro is not that it's not going to be an awesome device. I'm sure the experience is going to be incredible. It's been just that there's not a killer use case. I, I think that's the other thing that is different this time with the iPhone. You had the internet in your pocket. You had a phone connected to that, right? You had email, rich email, mm -hmm. and you also had songs. You had, you could get rid of your iPod basically, which was, mm -hmm. that mattered back then. Now yeah, the I use just, cases I just, or the utility of that iPhone was immediate where here it's huge. great technology, for sure the best uh, a wearable technology, but still struggling. Is this a technology looking for a problem is my question. I think it probably is right now. And to your point about developers, I mean, that will ultimately tell the tale probably. If, if developers come up with some killer use case that people get super excited about, that will make the device a success. But I think we should go into it realizing that it feels like it's a device looking for a problem. It's awesome technology. Apple doesn't put anything out that isn't amazing. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there something that we are doing with this device that we can do with this device that we can't do with any other device that we also can't live without? I'm not sure yet. And I mentioned that this is the year where uh, it's going to be developers and tech enthusiasts. I'd put you and I definitely in the tech enthusiast category. Uh, we're also tech investors, and we're open to investing in developers who are building applications on top of this. And so it's important for Deepwater to have uh, Vision Pro for us to experiment with this and to understand how the tech is playing out. And so uh, very curious uh, to meet those developers in the years to come and, and see how that plays out. And I suspect this is also going to be the year where many will say that the product is dead on arrival, that meta, uh, what their initiatives around Quest have been have largely failed. I think they've sold six or eight million units over the first five, six years. And I think that, uh, you know, we're taking an approach of just, we're just having an open mind on this and, uh, you know, let's see where it goes. I'm excited to try the product uh, in more detail, but also in very measured in terms of how I think that, uh, you know, what the trajectory, how this plays out. Ultimately, I think that there is a drift towards consumers and immersion, immersive tech. And I think that Apple's going to, is committed to seeing this through. And so I think they get there, it may take a decade, but I think they're going to get there. I think this is a product that eventually could be 15% of revenue. We'll see how that plays out. But I just want to emphasize that uh, this is a year, two years, three years, where there's going to be, I think, understandable, some critics of the device. Uh, also interesting to note, as of recording here, that uh, the NASDAQ futures are up about 0.7%. Shares of Apple are up about 0.2%. Uh, the lead times have been kind of extending out, but of course, that's because of low supply. Um, I don't think it's because of a huge demand. Uh, this year, we're thinking 500,000 or less units. And so uh, we're going to report back as uh, we get our hands on this. And um, if, if, you, if there are any developers out there who are listening, uh, we'd love to hear what you're building. So we're going to shift to our second topic, which is uh, AI Doug Ewer on CNBC this week and talking about an AI bubble and TSMC. And before uh, you kind of uh, recap 
your thoughts on that. I just want to give people a brief introduction to TSMC. For those who don't know, this is, of course, Taiwan Semi. It's a $570 billion US dollar market cap company, and they, of course, make the most advanced chips. Over the past year, the stock is up, call it 24%. The NASDAQ is up around 37%. There is a, a lagger effect relative to the geopolitical environment in China and Taiwan, of course. And so, but um, you know, you've been great at kind of uh, foreseeing this this bubble that's coming. That's really exciting. Well, you can't say that you're great at foreseeing it until it actually happens. So I yeah, will, I will amend yeah. that comment. Uh, but I am going to keep banging the table because I do think it's going to happen. Uh, my logic has been simple. But to just go through it quickly, you look through history, you look back at other technologically driven bubbles like the Internet, like the PC, electricity, railroads, the list goes on. They all have the same fundamental structure, which is uh, there's some early innovation. People start to get excited. Their imagines run, uh, imaginations run wild. Capital starts to chase all those things. And eventually, too much capital chases every single good and bad idea that is going after the bubble. Uh, in my view, that's actually a necessary component of creating breakthrough technologies is you actually have to have an excess of capital to basically guarantee that whatever the technology is, every idea gets tried and it gets the greatest chance of actually breaking out. I don't but, think we have an excess of capital in AI right now, not yet. And we don't have mania in AI. If you look at some of the multiples of public companies, most of the Mag7 trades at call it between 20 and 35 or 40 times next year's earnings. That's not bubble Whoop. territory. Cisco was 100 in 2000, so we're still early. Yeah, definitely not there yet. What's the breaking point, the breakout point from being a, a theme that people are behind and investors generally embrace to this euphoria? Is, it, is, there, is there some kind of DNA around uh, that breakout point that every time... Uh, people turn around, there's a company beating numbers because of AI, or it's it's all over the press today. And so it's, uh, you turn around, you always see AI, but do, do you have an idea of what that kind of turning point is going to be in the next three to five years? I don't think it's something that's quantitative. I think it's very qualitative. It's going to be a thing where you just have to have a feel for what's going on in the world. And I think you get that feel from observing what these companies are building, observing how investors are thinking about deploying capital into these companies, and then also just observing the conversation, how people are talking about these technologies. Um, and so for me, again, kind of tracking all of these things, you put all those uh, qualitative factors together, it still feels super early. I mean, we talk about 100 million people, right, weekly, I think use chat GPT. Billions of people are on the internet. I mean, just to mm -hmm. put the scale in sense, I mean, ChatGPT is a baby right now. And those 100 million people, a lot of them are just messing around doing you know, nothing meaningful with it. There's probably a couple million people that are doing anything really meaningful with AI right now who aren't building it themselves, right? Like think about how much more that has to change because eventually billions of people are going to be using it just like the internet. From From my perspective, I'm on board with this upcoming bubble because... I just see this as close to electricity. And I think that something that's that profound of a change eventually is going to create that euphoria. And so uh, lines up in the same place, uh, maybe slightly different path on how we get there, but we're definitely on the same page there. And a company around this that a lot of people don't know as well is TSMC. TSMC reported on Wednesday night. Uh, so they had pretty solid earnings and the stock was up, I think, almost 10 percent yesterday. Uh, proudly, we own it um, in a couple of our strategies, our hybrid strategy that invests in public and private companies. It's really going after the AI theme. The thing about TSM is it's a $500 billion market cap company. People maybe have heard the name, but if you think about this idea of an everyone company, this is something I've written about before and I think talked about here before companies that build products that literally everybody in the world uses. TSM is probably the most under the radar everyone mm -hmm. company of all. Because if you, if you just sit here, I mean, I'm sitting in front of a couple of cameras, uh, a monitor, a few PCs, uh, an iPad, an iPhone. All those products have a handful of TSMC chips in them. So I might have 100 TSM chips in my house alone. 
Mm -hmm. um, and think about that across the scale of the world. You know, everybody, even if they just have a regular cell phone, right, that they're still probably using TSM chips in some way. So that's, that's the company where you think about how is AI compute going to evolve? Who's going to win? NVIDIA, AMD, somebody else. It doesn't matter because they all have to use TSM. That's sort of the bet that we've made is all roads lead to them in terms of AI compute, and they should win as a result. And one of the reasons why we feel good about that is that it's just really hard to build these advanced chips. Uh, they also said on their earnings call that their next generation, which is the two nanometer, two nodes, is uh, there are three right now. The orders that they have for that exceeds where they were at the same period for the uh, the three nan uh, nanometers. So I think that uh, it's just a really hard thing to do. Easy to say I make chips, very hard to do. TSMC does a great job of it. So we're going to jump to our last topic, which is the cat and mouse game between, uh, I don't know if it's the courts and Apple or regulation or steering in general, but. Of course, the Supreme Court this week decided not to hear the appeals from Apple and Epic related to this 2021 trial that went on. Apple won nine of the 10 cases. The one case that they lost was related to steering. So this means that Apple has to allow app developers to be able to insert, uh, will allow them to insert links into their apps that are downloaded through and discovered on the Apple's app store. And that allows them to transact directly with the customer, basically avoid the paywall. And Apple, shortly after that came out, uh, was issued some changes to the terms of conditions for developers in the App Store that basically say that they have to pay a 27% uh, tax if they transact off of platform. It's on the honor system, so the developer has to submit if they uh, close a customer that uh, they uh, the app was downloaded on the App Store. If they close that customer outside, uh, and Apple has the ability to audit uh, app developers to make sure that they're uh, uh, reimbursing Apple. And uh, you know, this was a surprise move for me. I, I had gone through and done the numbers and expected that this was about a four percent hit to Apple's earnings. Uh, I'm going to publish on that uh, or all that math comes from, but it was a measurable hit to earnings having some of these developers move in a different direction. And I think the real question here is, you know, what is the, what's the proper number that, you know, Apple should be compensated something, but how do, how do we figure out what the proper number is uh, that they should be compensated for, for having this app store? I think the, the only way you ever figure out proper numbers for compensation is through, uh, in this case, probably tense negotiation. See mm -hmm. where the market's at. I mean, a Apple has Freeman. gone out and basically set a price and said it's 30%, take it or leave it. Um, and these developers, and I think rightfully, like I think 30% feels like a lot. This is how I've always framed it. If you're Epic or if you're Match.com or Spotify or Netflix, you spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on marketing, driving consumers to go download these apps. And I do think that they should get recognized for the reality that they do spend a lot on marketing. Um, they're not just wholly reliant on Apple to show people that there is a Netflix app, there's a Match.com app or whatever it may be. Um, so it just feels like 30% and their actions are saying, hey, we feel like 30% is too much. I don't know what the right number is. And, mm -hmm. and any, we could go and we could throw out any number we want, 10%, 20%, 5%, I don't know. But the only way to figure out something that is quote unquote fair, I think, is to have the two parties get together. Uh, and figure out, you know, what is what is acceptable on both sides, meet somewhere in the middle that makes nobody happy, but you move forward. I think what's going to, I think the free market, you, I think you mentioned something about the free market, I uh, agree with that. And I think that part of these negotiations are just going to naturally play themselves out, is that if Apple is able to, I'm not sure what the legality of them charging uh, for app developers outside of the store feels like they're, kind of just circumventing what the ruling was, but let's say that that does stand. Eventually the market is, the developers will just figure it out. They'll, they'll say, no, this isn't worth it for me. We're going to pull our apps from Apple's app store and, or that they will pay for it. it, it to me, it just feels like the, the natural outcome here is just the free hand of the market will decide what the pricing is. Well, they have no lever though. I don't, I disagree with that Apple. And that's why it's gone to antitrust is because they're arguing that Apple's not allowing a free market process to occur. There is no negotiation, right? There is no appeal to say 30% is too much, take it or leave it. Uh, they 
tried these mechanisms, right? Epic has tried mechanisms. Netflix has used steering for a long time. Sorry, you can't sign up for a subscription on your iPhone. Please mm -hmm. go to our website. Um, so they've tried these workarounds. That is the free market. And now Apple's kind of crushing those, right? They're crushing could, the one thing developers the, were doing. Couldn't the free market just be for these app developers to say, I don't want to use Apple's uh, app store? Isn't that one they way could they say could say that? Yeah, they, they could say that. But I think that then you get into a question of what's good for the customer. Because at some point, the app developer can just say, well, if I have to pay 30%, I'm going to have to charge my customers more because I still need to make a margin. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's what gets ignored in this case when we get into what's fair. Who, who's going to eat the 30%? There's three options, right? Apple, the customer, or the developer. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. And uh, at some level, each of the three. Needs you think to. about the 30% needs to have some responsibility for rec rectifying that. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be all the developers. And I think that's sort of how they feel right now because Netflix for doesn't sure, raise yeah. its prices on the iPhone. If you sign up there, it's the same as if you sign up on the web, same as if mm -hmm. you sign up on your Mac. So maybe, maybe that's what the free market is, is to say, Hey, look, you know, if you want to sign up on an Apple device, we, we totally support you, but you're going to have to pay 30% more than if you just sign up on your Mac. Makes sense if uh, they want to continue to be a part of the app store. And my thought is, if again, if if they don't like it, just uh, no one's forcing them to sell on, on the app store. They can just take their business someplace else. But that's yeah, I, uh, I don't think this case is over. I'll just I'll yeah. leave it there. I think there's still something that doesn't feel For sure. fair, certainly from 100%. the developer's standpoint. And I think they'll keep fighting. Oh uh, yeah, you want want to see somebody blowing a gasket? Tim Sweeney from Epic. Look at his tweets uh, after all of this too so it, it ain't over that's for sure and uh, but this episode is uh, a wrap on behalf of Doug Gene and Deepwater bye for now <laughs>